Thank you for joining us from home today. And I, I need some help from the congregation this morning. This will be your phrase. How hot is it? Okay. It is so hot. How hot is it? It is so hot that cows are giving evaporated milk. <laughs> How hot is it? How hot is it? I saw a bird pull a worm out of the ground using an oven mitt. <laughs> That's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. It is so hot out. How hot is it? It is so hot that chickens are laying hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> we are having a heat wave, and uh, it's going to wave bye-bye uh, this afternoon, and so we'll get a little bit of rain sparse through the week. Came to church this morning wanting to hear weather forecast, anything other than heat. And what do I do? I just mess with your brain. Acts chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put them in prison, handing them over to the guard by four squads of four soldiers each, Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. God's plan. I wish I could tell you that I know God's plan for your life and for my life. And that plan is simply to serve God. I know that. God's plan is that none should perish but all might have eternal life. I know that. But when we look here at the story of James, we look at this particular part of Acts, we want to know why. When things don't go right, the natural response is, why? He had James, the brother of John, put to death. The final day. What will be your final day? What will you have accomplished on your final day? You see, some people get really distraught about the fact that they get cancer and two years later, three years later, they pass away. And others get distraught because their loved one was killed in an auto accident and didn't have time to think about death. They just were gone. God has a plan and God has a purpose. You were knitted together in your mother's womb. God knew about you and has everything in proper alignment for your life. But you say that didn't change James' life. I mean, he, he literally got executed for the kingdom. And pastor, how can that bring glory and honor to God? God has a plan and God has a purpose. And what is our final day like? All the days ordained for me were written in the book before one of them came to be. All the days. God has a plan. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works and your wonders I know from afar. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained. God has a purpose. God has a plan. In all our days are ordained by him. James' days were ordained by God. God had a purpose and God had a plan. And it was awesome to know that God has a peace for us in the midst of struggles. 1 Peter 5, 17 says, I, I, I cast all my care upon you. I cast all my anxiety upon you for you care for me. God cares for us. And God has a plan and God has a purpose for us. And in James' situation, there was a reason why he left this earth at the time he did. And God's plan was being executed. 
And so you must just trust God that he's going to work on all things. You remember that these two brothers were trying to figure out how things were going to lay out with Jesus. And they came to Jesus. They said, we would like to be at the right hand and left hand when you get into government. When you get into, you, you set up government, we want to be the right and the left. And Jesus said, uh, you think you're ready to take the cup? Matter of fact, you will take the cup of suffering that I take, you will take. That is, that is a major statement. And so when we see James here being executed, uh, being the first of the apostles to be a martyr for the cause of Christ, we realize it's a fulfillment of what Jesus said. You will go through the cup of suffering just as I go through the cup of suffering. And so it's, it, it shouldn't catch us by surprise that this, this happens. But this is the price of the gospel. You see, we all live a life, and no matter how we live it, we're paying somebody or something. The alcoholic is paying his soul to the devil, and he's being destroyed. We pay our time and our talents to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have eternal life. There is a tremendous amount of joy in being in the presence of God Almighty. And God desires praise even in the most difficult of days. God is still worthy of our praise. And when you enter into the spirit of praise and giving God praise, there is a peace that only God can give. Put the death with the sword. It's fun to preach the exciting things of the scriptures. But there was a lot of days that wasn't a really exciting. And this is like 10 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. And now Peter's on deck. James has gone to the plate and gotten slaughtered. Now Peter's on deck, meaning he's next in line. He's in jail. Let's go on and read what it says here. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God. But the church. Say it with me. But the church. I love this story because there's some really nitty-gritty stuff here that we need to get a hold of. And that God has a plan, God has a purpose, and how do we work through the final day, but then also the extended ministry. The night before Herod was to, bring, was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers and bound with two chains and sentries stood guard on the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He, stuck, he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up! He said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. What's the exciting part about this? What's so exciting about what, what is What is the ultimate thing of this thing? Well, Pastor, it's simple. The, the greatest thing of all is, is that the chains fall off. Yes, that is miraculous. But I want to propose to you this statement. James has gotten beheaded by the sword. However you want to say it, he's gone. Peter's on deck, waiting to be crucified, waiting to be put to death by Herod, knowing it's about to happen because it's happened to his brother. Apostle, it's happened in, in, in to the other apostle. So he's, he's next in line. But I propose to you something that's very simple here. Peter was sleeping. Now, how do you sleep when your life is on the line? How do you sleep when, when someone who's done the same thing you're doing, preaching the gospel, if they get martyred and, and tomorrow might be your day? How do you sleep? To me, this is the power of God Almighty. 
It is the peace of God that passes all understanding. We cannot fathom the peace of God. We cannot declare the peace of God. We don't know how that the peace of God comes about, other than the fact that we pray, seek the face of God, and God shows up. And when God shows up, the power and the glory of God comes to us and does a wonderful, wonderful event in our lives. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything of loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom sake I have lost all things. Consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. It's all about letting Christ be number one. It's all about letting Christ flow in our lives and to know that it is the power of God Almighty that brings us. It's all about surrendering totally to Him. It's so important that we recognize that, the fact. And being found in Him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God as by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His suffering, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to obtain to the resurrection from the dead. All oh, the power of God Almighty being resurrected from the dead. Jesus was resurrected, and, and we must recognize the fact that we walk with God, and He gives us peace beyond comprehension. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Peter was totally involved with Jesus at the crucifixion. Remember, he was the one that kind of stood by him from a distance and was criticized for not standing up for who he was. And, and Peter went through a lot in his life, but he knew about the suffering. And, and connecting with Christ through the time of suffering. But he also knew the scripture that the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How did he sleep? Literally, the presence of God Almighty was with him, guarding his mind and his heart. That he didn't have to be overcome with anxiety, overcome with sleeplessness, because he was where he needed to be with God. And God was working out all things. The angel suddenly comes in. There's, there's this bright light. And the other thing that astounds me is, is what's not written. Nobody else wakes up. Matter of fact, he is sleeping so hard, Peter's sleeping so hard, that the angel literally has to hit him on the side to wake him up. And there's a light inside this cell. And to me, this is phenomenal that how this all place takes place. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. It's interesting to me that we must recognize that the power of God works miracles. But the power of God works miracles as we step forward in faith. God's not going to do what we can do. We can put our clothes on. Peter could put his clothes on. That was something he could do. The, the angel wasn't saying, oh, here, let me pick up your robe. Let me put some, oh, here's your sandals. Let me put the sandals on. No. God expects us to do what we can do. The, the thing that we really need to do in life is do our very best and leave the rest with God. Do your very best and leave the rest with God. The angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. I don't know about you, but this, this has to be an unbelievable experience. And it happened just as it says it happened. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea 
that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought it was, he was seeing a vision. They passed the first, the second guards and came to the, to the uh, iron gates leading to the city. It's one thing to get through the in, inner gates. But to walk up to the iron gate, to walk up the gate that's locked, the final, final, final door out, it opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly an angel left him. I've been watering at night right before sunset. And by the time I get done watering it, it's getting dark. And there's nothing like a cool breeze on a hot summer night. I haven't experienced that for about two weeks. <laughs> but this is where he's at. He was in prison. He's a block away. He's by himself. And the breeze is catching him in the face. And it's kind of waking him up more. And he's getting his bearings that, hey, I was in prison. I am not in prison. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and the servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening the door and examined, exclaiming that Peter, Peter, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that Peter was there, their response was, it must be his angel. Well, his angel showed up all right. Got him out of prison, but it, it's no longer with him. It is, it is Peter himself. But Peter kept on knocking. Why did he keep on knocking? He kept on knocking because he wanted them to open the door. And he, and he saw them and they were they were astounded. They they saw him and they were astounded. They just astonishment just overpowered them. They couldn't believe it was Peter. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. And describe how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James, the brothers, about this. And he said, then he left for another place. Why did he come and share in the middle of the night? Because there was people still praying for him. The church earnestly sought God for his deliverance. And then when God answered, they didn't believe it had happened. And so here he is, a, re, a, a definite answer to prayer. He wants them to know, hey, God's answered your prayers. But more than that, he said, I was on deck to face death. I want you to know I've escaped, but you may be next. He was giving them the warning that there was going to be other people coming down the pike. There was going to be other attacks. There's going to be other persecutions happening. And, and he wanted them to know that possibility was very, very much real. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what became of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and, and did, did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. The Roman rule was if you was guarding prisoners and they escaped, your life was given. The final day for the executors, the final day for the guard to be put to death. You see, Peter had an extended ministry. Now I know without a doubt. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord had sent his angels and rescued him. Peter's ministry was extended because the angels got him out of prison. But it cost the prison guards their life. Now, why is it that James is put to death and Peter 
ministry is extended. Why is that? I mean, God, are you a fair God? What, what, God, what's the deal? God has a plan. And the ultimate, most important thing in our life is not what happens in our life, but how we react to what happens in our life. And we must recognize that when we have surrendered our lives to the Lord, when we've raised our hands in praise and worship, when we've prayed in the Spirit, we know that God is working in our behalf. Do you realize that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for the person who says, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus is interceding. The Holy Spirit is interceding. The plan of God is being, being uh, moved about in our lives. And here is this individual who has just escaped prison. And they're going to preach the gospel. They're not going to stop. They're going to continue. Their ministry is extended. And why is it that Peter got the, got the extension and James didn't? That's God's business, not ours. You see, we, our thoughts are so much lower than God's thoughts. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. And his plans are so much grander and greater than ours. And we must leave well enough alone. Not to dwell on why, 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 why. But to give God praise. Because God used James to touch people's lives. God is using Peter to touch people's lives. But it doesn't stop there. God is using you. Yes, you, sitting in the pew, right there, you at home, sitting in your room. Yes, God wants to use you to lead somebody else to Christ. To be a friend to someone who's going through a very difficult time. To send a thank you card. To send a word of encouragement. To lift somebody else up. It's God's plan, God's purpose for us to be kind and generous one to another. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and now they joined together and sought in an audience with him, having secured the support of Gladys, a trusted personal servant of the king. They asked for peace because they depended upon the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. When it says he sat with an elaborate robe, it doesn't, it doesn't cut it. He had, in our modern day, sequence. He had silver. He had jingle bells, if you would, on his robe. Then when the sun came up, it would hit that robe and it would glisten like unbelievable light being reflected black. And so it was, wasn't just a robe. It was a neon bright robe that reflected the light and it was very, very distinct and very uh, outstanding. They shouted as they appeared, as they saw him appear and as they came together, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. They were giving him the adoration of being God. Surely this isn't a man's voice. This has got to be the voice of God. And Herod accepted those compliments. The lack of praise. God deserves the praise. No man deserves God's praise. And so Herod did not pass the praise on to God. He accepted it. And when he accepted it, immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten with worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their missions, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. The word of God continued to spread and increase. You see, the lack of praise 
immediately because Herod did not give praise to God. An angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten up with worms and died. Retribution for the sins for killing God's people, very possible. But the lack of praise is such a pronouncement here that it's very declarative. The psalmist says we're to praise God seven times a day. And we're living in a culture right now that is very distraught. And it's important that the body of Christ recognize that they are the children of God and that God deserves praise no matter what goes on. No matter if the stock market bombs tomorrow, no matter if we walk in the grocery store and there's no food on the shelves, we are to praise God anyhow. you say, Pastor, I don't read that in Scripture. Yeah, you do. It says, in all things give thanks. In all things give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So what is God's thanks right? To give thanks. But we've got to realize that we, in our own lives, want to balance out and figure out, well, God, why does this person get to live and this one don't? Why do good people suffer and, and, and rotten people be okay? Fine. God has a plan. And God has a purpose. And we are not the ones that set the plans. And we're not the ones that set the purpose. But God is. And as God has knitted you together in your mother's womb, He has poured into you gifts and talents for such a time as this. As I see in the Middle East the, the wars and rumors of wars and the constant harassment that's happening with, with Israel right now. It, it makes us say, Jesus, is today the day you're coming back? Is this the rapture of the church going to take place today, tonight, tomorrow? God has a plan. And the greatest thing we can do is allow the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And when we give God the praise, when we give God the glory, when we take time to say thank you, Lord Jesus, simple thing of praying over your food, giving God thanks, giving God thanks that you have a car. If you have the air tissue, don't work that. Try walking. Give God thanks for what you have. I propose to you that if you don't give God thanks for what you have, you might not get much more in life. You see, you will prosper, you will succeed in life as you give God the praise and give God the glory. He will be there for you as you humble yourself. And I think part of the problem of, of giving God praise is that we're, we are the ones in control and we are allowing pride to overpower us to where we think we're the ones that are making things happen. And the truth of the matter is, God will only do what he can do, and he will not do what he expects us to do. Peter had to put his own clothes on. Peter had to walk out of there. <clears throat> the angel said, put your clothes on. Put your sandals on. Let's take a walk. You see, Peter knew how to walk. He walked on water. He walked with Jesus. And he walked out of the prison. And he walked downtown to the house where everybody gathered to worship. He walked. God wants us to walk with him. There may be a storm and you may be asked to walk on the water. But you are only do it by the grace of God. But you still have to move. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. God, you are an awesome God. And Lord, I thank you for the plan that you have for our lives. We are set apart for kingdom use. We are set apart for the plan of God to be fulfilled in our lives. Lord Jesus, you said that we can have life and we can have it more abundantly. 
And so, God, we, we ask that you would pour into our hearts today the power, the grace, and the mercy of God Almighty, that we might experience the fullness of God, not just walking through life, but allowing the Holy Spirit to empower us to give God praise when things aren't going the way we think they should go. Because, God, when we give you praise, you begin to come on the scene, and your presence brings a peace your presence brings a joy. Your presence brings a hope. And we're so grateful for that presence. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would move among us throughout this week that we might let the presence and the power of God Almighty work through us. Forgive us, Lord, where we have not served you properly. Forgive us, Lord, where we've questioned you and wondering why you allow things to happen. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for not giving you the praise and the honor that you are worthy of. For you truly are worthy of praise, glory, Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. And thank you, Lord, for empowering us. In Jesus' precious name. Will you stand with me? Knowing God, loving people, hope revealed. Such a simple statement, but such profound strength in knowing God. As we read the scriptures, as we spend time in God's presence, knowing God loving people. When you know God, it's an automatic that you love people. When you know God and you love people, there's automatic hope is revealed. And that's what this church is based on. Knowing God, loving people, hope revealed. And we desire to continue to practice that principle of knowing God. That's why these altars are going to be open in a minute. These altars are going to be open in a minute for us to come and to pray to get to know God better so that we can love others and see hope revealed in their lives. And as we pray for others and see hope revealed in their lives, guess what happens in our hearts? Hope revealed. A greater hope, a greater desire, a greater desire to seek God and be hungry for the things of God. For those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be Bill. Holy Spirit, we open our hearts for the moving of your spirit as we open these altars for people to come and to pray. Lord, we ask that you would just help us to realize that knowing God, Lord, that there's nothing greater than that. And Lord, for those who have come out today to be in your house, Lord, I ask that you would bless them immensely. Lord, for those that are home in the hospital hearing this message today. God, strengthen them. Bring healing to them in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And thank you, Lord, for those who have been so faithful to give of their time, their talents, and resources to the ministry of this church. God, this is your church. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the principles of your word that has been launched in our hearts today. And may we serve you with all of our heart, body, soul, and mind, now and forever. Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for doing it from home. The altars are open when you come. We come and experience the blessings of the Lord. If you'd like to be